All right. I think we're going to get going. Oh, sweet. Wow, this is so amazing. Thank you so much to everyone. This is a great turnout for this meeting. Um, this is really awesome. So super appreciate you all taking an hour or so out of your evening um, to, to join us here. Uh, so I am Naomi Grunditz. I am an aide for Councilman Sandoval. She is actually presenting at the planning board right now. Um, so she will be joining us in a little bit, but otherwise she would um, be giving an intro um, and saying hello to everyone, but she'll be joining us later, especially for the Q&A portion. She should be join there. the meeting. Oh, sweet. Um, so we've also got uh, Josh, uh, who I mentioned earlier. Um, Josh is a planner with the planning department and he is here for the Q&A portion as well. He's an ADU expert. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, I'm gonna give a, a bit of a walkthrough of, of ADUs. And then we're gonna have most of the time left over for Q&A because um, this really is meant to be uh, interactive and hopefully kind of informal um, and just an opportunity for you all to ask questions um, and see each other uh, community members. Normally we would be doing these in person um, and we're very sad that we have to be remote right now. But again, thank you all so much for joining us. All right, uh, here we go. Can everyone see my screen? Thumbs up. Oh, thank you. All right, so this was the overview of uh, town halls. So, oh, and by the way, this is the first of two town halls we're doing. Um, we like to do at least two to make sure as many people as possible can attend. We like to space them out as much as possible and have one in the evening of a weekday and one kind of on a weekend. So if uh, you know someone that wasn't available to attend tonight, uh, there is also the opportunity to uh, attend on the 29th. And recordings of this presentation and the 29th will also be posted on the web page, um, uh, the landing page for this project. Uh, so anyone can watch them after the fact. Dan Aral joined the meeting. How people can introduce themselves. I, I don't know if I turned on a certain setting for that, but it's kind of hilarious. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna walk everyone through uh, what ADUs are, um, the zoning and ADU rezonings, what those look like in general and what they would be looking like in West Highland. Um, we're gonna talk about the, the survey that's been out for a while that a lot of y'all have taken. And then we're gonna go into uh, what the continued outreach and the timeline for this project looks like. And after that, it's all Q&A. So what are ADUs? Uh, they, that is a very technical term used in Denver um, and some other cities, but really people mostly know them as um, casitas, carriage houses, in-law cottages, guest houses. In Denver, sorry, they have a very specific, um, a very specific definition. So an ADU stands for accessory dwelling unit, and it means a extra smaller unit on a piece of property in addition to the main house. And the keyword here is accessory. So these structures have to be accessory to a single unit house. So if you live in a duplex, each side of a duplex can't build an ADU. You can only build an ADU on a property that has a single unit house and with the proper zoning. So a little bit about ADUs. There's actually two forms. Um, there's detached and attached. So this is a detached ADU. This is probably what most of us think of when we think of an ADU. It's the smaller unit separated in the back of the property. But an, an ADU is also, uh, can also be attached to the main house. So it could look a little bit like a addition. It could look like an addition or it could actually be in the, like, the upper story or even in the basement. Um, there's a lot of nice finished out basements in our homes here in Denver. So those could be converted into an attached ADU. And this, for example, is an actual home in Denver that has an attached ADU in the basement. Um, and it's pretty much not visible from the street. So that's an example of how that would work out. 
Um, and just going forward, I'm going to, when I talk about ADUs, I'm really going to be referencing the detached ADUs when we talk about forms or questions about those, just because that's mostly what people are interested in. Um, but just wanted to all know that there actually is that second form of more like an addition or part of the main house. So ADUs are very strictly regulated in the zoning code. Um, there are restrictions about how tall they can be, how large they can be overall, where they're placed on the property. So you can't put them right next to your neighbor's, uh, your property line between your neighbor. There's rules about how many people can live in them um, and more, it's extensive. Um, in addition, ADUs have to be designed comparable in composition and appearance to the main house. They're really meant to not appear as if it's a two unit property. Um, you're really meant to see just the regular main house when you're walking down the street, the ADU, again, accessory. Accessory is the, the key word here. Also really importantly, um, an ADU can't be subdivided or sold off differently. And that's again, because of the word accessory. It always needs to be sort of attached or tethered accessory to something. So um, that's why you, you, can't, you can't separate it off and it would be its own standalone thing. So that would never be allowed. Um, and in addition, in, in West Highland, in the zone districts we're talking about that are single unit zoned, uh, if you wanna build an ADU, you actually have to live on the property. So you can live in the ADU or the main house, but um, you can't, for instance, build an ADU and then rent both of those and go live somewhere else. So that's another uh, important restriction to keep in mind. And overall, um, ADUs in the Denver Zoning Code are very different from duplexes, where with a duplex, you've got, you're allowed to have two equally sized, kind of equally prominent dwelling units. They're, they're very different from that. They're not apartments um, and they're not commercial zoning. And Zoning for ADUs is not a pathway to any of these other things. It's its own standalone thing. It's meant to be in addition to single unit. So some of the reasons that we've been hearing from neighbors um, that they wanna build ADUs are for financial stability. So extra income from renting out the, the unit, either long-term or short-term um, because ADUs are required to be really pretty small. Um, they are a bit naturally more affordable to live in. So when they do provide a little bit lower cost living um, for people in the neighborhood. They also are really often used for aging in place. So as we get older, we can stay on our properties and maybe we need a little bit smaller space. We can go live in the ADU and rent out the main area or have our families. Um, uh, so, you know, for instance, my, my mom and dad could move into the ADU in my back, um, it helps save a lot with senior living and childcare costs and things like that. Um, happening an ADU on the uh, on the alley, actually, those again, those detached ADUs can also help provide what we call eyes on the alley. So, just the fact that there is somebody living back there, and and you know, considering that their home and taking care of it, it actually deters crime. Um, tends to keep alleys a little more tidy. And lastly. Um, it's a way to help displacement, as we know the cost of living is rising a lot um, in our neighborhoods, and this is a way to add housing and stability without demolishing anything, um, without demolishing the existing homes and without building apartments, so without changing radically the way a neighborhood feels and looks. All right, so now we're going to get into some technical, uh, <laughs> some technical talk about zoning and ADUs, um, and again, yeah. please, um, uh, We'll have, oh, you can put comments in the chat uh, right now. We'll answer them at the at the end. Um, but also if I start talking about something that you're like, Naomi, I'm not following you. This is not clear. This is too technical. Um, please let us know. I will stop and I will, um, <laughs> I will clarify uh, because this is meant to be uh, understandable for everybody. And I know I can get a little technical. Um, but some of these questions that are in there now, just know we'll answer those in the Q&A portion. And also thanks to Josh uh, for answering some of those right now. Uh, so ADUs in Denver, where are they allowed? Um, sorry. So they're actually already allowed in about a third of the city. They are allowed already in any zones. So these zones in color actually on this map here that already allow two or more units or commercial buildings or in certain single unit areas. So. Um, every area here in color does allow ADUs, but remember, you can't build an ADU on next to, an, like as attached to an apartment building. It has to be, if there's actually just a single unit home, 
it happens to be in a zone district that's maybe zoned for something different, that could build an ADU, but you can't build an ADU and a duplexer and a row house. So we're gonna focus more on the single unit zones that uh, end in a one, because those are the ones that allow ADUs. Um, if you wanna build an ADU and you live in a single unit zone and you don't have that one, you have to do a rezoning. Um, and the rezoning literally just adds that one. So for example, USUB becomes USUB1. And you all are like, what the heck is USUB? These are just, just alphabet soup. So <laughs> I'm gonna do a quick zoning code explanation. Um, all our zone districts look like this. There's kind of three sections separated by dashes. The very first one um, is always gonna be sort of the largest context, the overall context of the area. So you, um, which West Highlands has means urban and it's often applied to our inner ring suburbs. It's single unit. Um, they can be, there can be single unit, but it's also kind of a denser um, uh, urban environment. The second set of letters starts getting more granular and um, more uh, gives more direction. So SU is for single unit. Um, and that means that pretty much all you can build there is a single unit home. And then the very last set of letters, uh, which is A, B, or C, there's even D, E, and F, I think. Um, those actually stand for the average lot sizes um, and the minimum lot sizes needed um, in the neighborhood. So for a B, that's an average lot size of 4,500 square feet. For C, it's 5,500 square feet. And then finally, at the very end, if you have a one, that means that you're allowed to build an ADU. So that's a little bit of the zoning code there. So where are ADUs, now back to where ADUs are allowed in Denver, where are they already allowed in West Highland? Um, so they're already allowed actually in all of these parcels that are in orange on this page. And some of these are because they're zoned for commercial areas. Some of them are zoned for multi-unit, like we were saying by right, they can do that. Some of them are single unit areas with the one after it. And by the way, you can always find, there's a bunch of maps that the city provides that you can do interactive maps. You can look up addresses. Um, I'm gonna post this presentation on the web page afterwards. Um, check out these links, they're really fascinating. You can learn a lot about zoning and look up a lot of things. So there's about a thousand uh, parcels that already allow ADs in West Highland. There also have been a bunch of one-off requests for rezoning from single unit zone that doesn't allow ADU to a single unit zone that does allow. And one of the reasons we're here today asking the community about um, if you would like a larger rezoning is that West Highland is now the source of the largest number of one-off, these one-off requests in District 1. It used to be Sloan's Lake, um, and that's why we started talking to Sloan's Lake, got their buy-in, they wanted to be rezoned, went and did a big rezoning. You can kind of see in this big red blob down there, that was Sloan's Lake. Um, so now we're talking to West Highland because um, there seems to be a lot of demand and a lot of interest from neighbors about a rezoning. Um, and every time one of your neighbors has to go through a rezoning to build an ADU, um, it costs $1,000 for them. And they have to go through the rezoning process. Uh, it's the same process anybody goes through for rezoning, whether you're rezoning to just get an ADU ability or you're rezoning to, you know, people that rezone to get an apartment building. It's all the same process. Um, it's long, it's complicated, costs $1,000. So the alternative is that Councilman Sandoval um, can sponsor a rezoning on behalf of the neighborhood. And that's what we've been asking um, you all, the neighbors, um, if that's something that you'd be interested in. And very importantly, this rezoning would not change anything else. It just adds the one. It just gives the ability to build an ADU. Um, it will not change anything else about the zoning or where things can be built in the neighborhood. So here's a map that hopefully you've seen on the web page. Um, this is the map of parcels that uh, would be rezoned under this proposal. There's quite a few of them. Um, so as you can see, we've got USUA, B, and C. And again, all those, those letter differences just refer to kind of the average lot sizes in these areas. Um, and all in all, it would be around 3,200 parcels to rezone. And they would all just get the one at the end, which gives people the ability to build an ADU, certainly not a requirement. It's just an option. 
I also wanted to add this slide um, to talk about historic districts because West Highland, um, I think is our neighborhood in district one that has the highest number of historic districts um, in one neighborhood. And people often wonder about ADUs and historic districts. So um, there's about, I just crunched these numbers earlier, there's about 562 properties in four historic districts. Um, and ADUs are allowed in historic districts. The um, Landmarks Department supports them um, just as you could do an addition on a building, you could build an ADU on a historic building. They would also be subject to design review <laughs> standards. So anybody who lives in one of these um, historic districts and especially if it's a contributing building would have to go through the rigorous design um, approval for their ADU as they would with any other large work that they would wanna do on their house. All right, so to survey results so far, um, we're incredibly grateful to all of you um, for, we almost at 400 responses to the survey, which is actually a huge response rate. Um, so thank you so much. We will keep the survey open for a while so more people can, can take it, um, but that's already, already a really great number. So here's what we have so far. I just pulled this this morning. Um, we have out of those almost 400 responses, we have 70% um, in support. 22% uh, opposed to rezoning, and six, almost 7% kind of undecided. So hopefully this today will help people who are undecided. Sorry. We also asked, you may have noticed, um, if the rezoning goes through, are people interested in building an ADU? So uh, this is how it worked out. Um, the largest number of people were interested in doing it, but not right away. So maybe in, in three to seven years. They are difficult to build. They're ex rather expensive. Um, they can be. Um, and it is a huge project, so it can take people a while. Um, the second largest group <laughs> was actually people who don't intend to build an ADU. And then there were maybe 50 people who are ready, ruined to go if this rezoning does go through in the next couple of years, um, ready to build an ADU. And it, again, it's interesting to think this is out of 3,000 or so um, properties out of 400 people-ish that have answered this survey so far. Um, we also asked people if they did intend to build an EDU, what did they wanna build it for? What do they wanna use it for? Um, so again, top answer is I don't plan to build one, um, but the, the really the, the top choices here are as a guest house or just for personal use for more space, which we all need during COVID um, or for housing a family member. And then down towards the bottom is actually renting it out as, to a long-term tenant. Um, and then other was all sorts of things like a gym or, or stuff like that. And at the very bottom is a short-term is short-term rental. And I, I do think that's interesting to point out because we know short-term rentals are they're they're controversial. Um, they can they can be, you know, some people have had problems with short-term rentals next to them. And so I know we've heard a lot of concern about maybe people are just building ADUs just to short-term rent them and, and that doesn't sound appealing. Um, I think it's good to see that people do not necessarily intend to use them for short-term rentals. It's pretty much at the bottom. Um, and actually a Denver article just came out this last week that went and crunched the numbers and found that this is actually pretty true in terms of all the ADUs that exist in the whole city currently. Um, only about I think it was 12% are used for short-term rentals. Um, so that really does play out um, in reality. All right, so we're almost done and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, our outreach plan, we are here. Uh, we've done, we've posted the survey and the webpage. We've done mailers, we've done flyers. Um, we're at the first of our two town halls. We're going to continue to track responses. And we actually had a, a goal of getting 380 responses, which we have surpassed now, amazingly. We're keeping the survey open. Um, we'll probably end up closing it in mid-February, um, but uh, please let us know if, if you have a suggestion. Um, if there seems to be interest, we can always keep doing more outreach. And this all leading up to eventually, um, after the survey is closed, if there is support, um, then that is when the actual rezoning application could be submitted. Because all of this outreach that we're doing right now is really just to gauge if there's enough interest and support in the community to do this. So on this next page, you'll see we are still very early in the process. 
in the sense of, of public outreach, you'd like to do a lot of work here at the beginning. There's still this entire public process and the rezoning process that would happen if the application is submitted. So this is a timeline of the rezoning process. Um, there's required public hearings that happen at various stages. And there are also required notifications, again, that will be mailed to every single property owner um, at points along this process. So there will be a lot more opportunities for engagement and public comment all the way up until a final full city council public hearing at the very end. Uh, I have some resources here. Again, I'll have this posted on the, the web, um, the landing page. So please keep sharing the survey, um, keep, uh, uh, or also, um, uh, I believe on some of the uh, postcards, the postcards and the flyers sent out is my direct phone number. I've gotten quite a few calls from people. Um, they're not comfortable using the internet and just want to share their opinion over the phone. Um, I've talked to quite a few people that way, and that's uh, that's really great. Um, I've got my email on here, and then a couple of other interesting links going on. Um, we've got a really important project happening in the city that actually Josh is very involved in that will be over the next year looking at some of the rules and regulations around ADUs and making sure that they're getting us the outcomes that we really want. Um, so I highly recommend visiting that uh, website, signing up for their updates and following along with that. I've also got a link to the zoning code um, if you want to really dive into that and another link to a presentation that we did this summer um, that really dives into the regulations around ADUs, what may or may not prevent you from building one on your property um, and things like that. So we are to Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can all see each other. Um, Feel free, we can start with some of the questions in the chat. Um, oh, Councilman Sandoval, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, uh, would you like to, to say anything, give any words to our audience here? You've done great, thank you so much, Naomi. Um, sorry that I was late. I had a planning board agenda item that I'm working on for the Board of Adjustment, so my apologies, but I was here for most of the presentation and We'll just continue going and we can answer some of the questions that were in the chat. One of the ones that I saw, Naomi, was um, how does the support for the West Highland compare to the other neighborhoods that we've done? That's a great question. It's pretty comparable. Um, every So the work that um, Council Sandoval has done so far has been in first Chaffee Park. Um, they were the first neighborhood. They actually came to our office uh, and asked, uh, they started this whole process really, thanks to them. Um, that support was in the 70%. Um, Soames Lake support was in the 70%. So, and West Highlands is in the um, 70%. So it's pretty comparable. So one of the questions is, could we see the map of the no ADU responses. So do we have it mapped out where who, who responded no? Um, are, and maybe you could clarify, does that mean where people haven't responded or where they responded that they were opposed to the... Um... I think we'll have to ask, I think it was Ray. So Ray, if you could readjust your question for number one. Does it mean that they haven't it's responded or are it's they a map, a map of people who said no? Uh, we actually um, so we we ran into this with uh, the Chaffee Park. I think it it felt we can definitely have a map of who has responded or not, but sharing people's individual votes, um, we've had some complaints that that would feel like a violation of privacy. Um, and then he has, who is it that asked for rezoning to allow ADU in Highland? I, it's me. I'm asking if you would want accessory dwelling units throughout Highland um, because of the number of applicants that have come through and that are paying a thousand dollars in each individual parcel. We wanted to do 
and see if there's interest. So it's me who's asking the constituents and the residents of West Highland, are they interested in having accessory dwelling units? Um, so that says, I was, I was gonna add that it's based on, um, as I showed earlier in the presentation, there's been, what we were seeing was an indication that there was interest in, and that people wanted to do ADUs because there've been so many one-off requests. So individuals coming, going through the rezoning process one by one, um, the most, we've seen the most of those and out of all of district one happening in West Highland. So noticing that pattern, that's what triggered um, us to want to come and ask the neighborhood as a whole, hey, we're seeing this, we're seeing there's a lot of demand. Is this something that you would like? Naomi? Hi. Uh, Jason Berglund here. I, I've asked for it specifically. Um, I've been in contact with you guys and asked for it as well. So I'm yeah. happy to share that. It's no secret. So. Thank you, Jason. Sure. Appreciate that. Um, so we have another question, Ray, I'll go back to some of your questions, but someone said in the chat, please explain the city's ongoing bias against Airbnb type buildings. I have a rental, I can't convert, but you prefer that I do new construction in my backyard, more people, more buildings. So I don't quite understand the nature of this question, Jared. Um, so if you want to unmute and ask in a different way, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. I, I, hey, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I bought a rental property on my block in order to prevent the, the house being developed, which would have ruined my block. We're now in Packard. Subsequent, 15 years later, we became part of Packard Hill and therefore we have more protections, but I have a rental. It's right next door. Um, I rent it. Uh, however, there are rentals on probably every block on the north side. So my, my, my query is why the ongoing resistance to um, Airbnb type rentals when I can build one of these ADUs in my backyard and have the same number of people coming and going through the alley with suitcases or on the block with suitcases and I've, I've, I, and I've created more construction. So why the ongoing bias? Why the ongoing resistance when the, the vast majority of Airbnbs in this city are illegal and in high rises? Why the resistance to Airbnb type dwellings specifically? So I can't speak to that. I don't know if really? Josh can, but I'm not, I don't sit on the small working group. There's a working group well, regulate. but this is a citywide issue, and it's been a citywide issue can for I at least speaking? 10 years. Can I, can I finish so I can sure. answer Sorry. your question? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I don't sit on that working group for the Airbnbs. That legislation came before my time. That was my predecessor who voted on the allowing of 80 um, Airbnbs and the regulations around the fact that your Airbnb has to be your primary residence. Right. So, you so how do you feel about that? This isn't a conversation about Airbnbs, but if you would like to have a meeting with me about Airbnbs, I'm happy to take that offline. But we have tons of people here who are talking about the survey, and I want to respect everyone's evening and not go down the Airbnb rabbit hole because it is a rabbit hole with tons of Oh, it might be for you. It's not for me. Thank you. But yeah. So then we have some more questions on why would this rezoning process take so long when there is such strong support? So it's not the support or not support, it's the legislative process takes this long. So the, the community planning and development, if we were to move forward, we would work on the application and then it gets in the queue behind all of the other applications that are moving forward. So it's really the process of how long it takes to get these applications done, vetted, then through on the planning board agenda, and then through planning board and to city council. So it's really more of the process. It's not necessarily the, um, the support. So the Chaffee Park rezoning, it took much longer. And um, there were very different variables 
to the traffic park rezoning, we started pre-pandemic and we ended pandemic. So we literally had to take our whole entire outreach process and move it virtual. Um, and then the planning, community planning and development, the planning department, um, the planning board was not able to move virtual as quickly and nimbly as everybody else. We had to change some of our rules for boards to meet virtually. And so city council went and adopted those. So the, I think the Chaffee Park actually took probably over a year and a half. Um, but the Sloan's Lake process, which now we have, this would probably mirror more. I think it probably took about 10 months, nine or 10 months. So that's the, that's the reason why this legisla the legislation takes so long. Um, thank you, Josh, for answering that as well. And so Dan, has the clock started yet for West Highland? No, we are very in the very early stages of the outreach. You all just received postcards and flyers. So the formal application has not been submitted and the formal application wouldn't be submitted until I was able to come back to this um, to the neighborhood and let you know where we are on support. And then Gerald, I do hear you say that we should pull the neighborhood. The 7% is not realistic. We are pulling the neighborhood. So tell your neighbors to take the survey because every single property owner got a no. mailer and got a flyer. So um, I don't think it's realistic to say that we're going to have 3,000 people to fill out a survey. I just don't know any type of survey that's ever had every single participant fill out a survey. I'll say in a different way. I get surveys all the time from North High School, from my, my son's <clears throat> school, and I probably am not the one who always fills out the survey. So we're doing as much outreach as possible to make sure that we get really good outcomes. Uh, Will, William Hare, I see your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. I just wanted to answer one of the uh, questions in the chat. There was a question relative to uh, who is it they asked the rezoning be allowed for ADUs in the West Highlands. And I just wanted to, I believe I'm the only person I can see of attendees that is in the West Highlands Land Use uh, Committee. Um, so I just want to let everybody know that the Land Use Committee um, <clears throat> engaged with Naomi and Amanda and asked to move forward with this. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Um, we've got some really other great questions um, I can start taking as well. So, um, we had a question from Matthew. Have we seen any adjustment, increase or decrease in crime in neighborhoods that have already uh, approved ADUs? I think that's a really good question. Um, I don't think that there is any cor correlating <laughs> evidence of, of crime with or without ADUs. There's still only ever, I mean, I mate Josh, I think you know, how many ADUs are there in Denver that have been built in the last 10 years? <laughs> We have just under 400. I think it's like 388 ADUs that have been permitted, constructed in the past. Yeah. You know, yeah, hey, sorry. Just to clarify that for you guys, I guess I'm quite, I'm wondering specifically in the neighborhoods where we've had blanket ADU approvals, ah. have there been any adjustments as opposed to the, the one-offs here and there? So in the neighborhoods that have had um, legislative rezonings that we're presenting here tonight, Matt, um, Chaffee Park has no permits pulled zero. So not one ADU has been built. And in the Sloan's Lake neighborhood, only four permits have been pulled for accessory dwelling units since the um, rezoning was done. So I don't think that there's actually enough data yet to do any of that. Just as Naomi mentioned, just because we're allowing the entitlement doesn't mean that we are allowing the ability to do it. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yep. So back to some of the comments from Ray in here. Um, so the, if ADUs are such a good idea, why is it Councilwoman Sandoval not rezone my neighborhood? Because I haven't heard con re concern. I haven't heard a desire to do that. This is community driven and I do things community driven. So Ray, you know people in my neighborhood who wanna do it, tell them to reach out to my office. I'm happy to look into it but there has not been a desire and there actually has not been one rezoning in my neighborhood. Um, so the comment ADUs encourage scrape-offs, Airbnb parking infrastructure. 
If you want to prove and you want to see data that proves that, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. But the data nationwide does not support that statement. But it's, I think it's probably more of a personal opinion, which is absolutely valid. Um, and you're absolutely able to feel that way if that's how you feel. Um, so thank you, Bill, for answering the other one. And then number four, the West Highland Neighborhood Association emailed the council office survey. I have no, I cannot speak to why West Highland Neighborhood sent out their survey to everyone, including people outside of West Highland. If you want to ask that question to your neighborhood registered neighborhood organization, please feel free to. I feel like they were sharing the information that we had been working on and that the land use committee was advancing, um, but I can't speak for anybody out anything that the RNO had done. So I think that answered all of those. Um, so what impact on parking has been seen in other neighborhoods that have been subject to accessory dwelling units? So as I mentioned, Chaffee Park was the first one in Council District 1 to get rezoned. No permits have been pulled for accessory dwelling units. Sloan's Lake, there's been four. So I think the most, the the biggest amount of number of ADUs that have been built with one off rezonings, meaning that your neighbors went to ahead before city council, I think is in West Highland. So we'll have to monitor what's happening in West Highland because I think the majority of accessory dwelling units probably have been built in this neighborhood. Um, and I don't know, I think that this neighborhood already has unique parking concerns because of the 32nd and Lowell area and the residential parking area that is in that. So I think this area already suffers from unique parking problems um, that probably other areas don't have. Maybe Regis might have a few because of the um, university and the amount of people who are there, but we don't have that data yet. So I'm happy to follow that as, as we go along. I know East Colfax just rezoned their neighborhood and so we can, I think that the city is watching and monitoring that as well. Um, will you support, what support will be available to property owners with adjacent properties when adjacent property build AD without permits or exceed permit scope setbacks or bulk claims? Josh, can you talk, can you take that one on? Um, what support is there for property owners who have their neighbors building accessory dwelling units without permit or scope or not beating, meeting the bulk claim. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple, uh, it's a 311 call. I mean, if someone's building something illegally, we'll send out an inspector and that will be issued a work stop, you know, issue an order immediately. You're not allowed to build something that's unsafe or unpermitted. And that's an obvious life and safety issue and we'll shut it down immediately. And so if that's going on, then you know, you're free to call it in and report it as such. Do they, do they just call 311, Josh? Yeah, that's the simplest, cleanest way, I think. Okay. Yeah. One and other question. Oh, go ahead, Naomi. I was going to say, for those who don't know what 311 is, because um, I didn't before I started working for the city, um, you can literally dial 311 um, if you're within Denver. You can also uh, go to PocketGov. And what this is, it's a routing service, basically. You can contact the city with any complaint or question or request, like you could order extra trash bins through there. They route requests to the right department. Um, so that's why you'll hear a lot of, you'll almost always hear people from the city saying, call through on one, report it to PocketGov. It actually does end up, it gets to the right department. It's just a one, all in one place to submit things. One, one more question for you, Josh. Melissa asked, I pur purchased a half a duplex that is zoned U USUB. Would her parcel qualify for an ADU if it gets redefined as USUB1? Yeah, that one's tricky. So if you're in single unit zoning, but you're actually in a duplex, your mm -hmm. use is two unit. Currently, the ADU use is only allowed with a single unit dwelling use. So you have to be in a single unit uh, home primary structure, but the ADUs in Denver project is looking at expanding that use allowance to 
other uses. So in association with potentially two unit row home, other other properties like that. So we're not sure exactly what the outcome will be, but in the future potentially, but it sounds like no, your current use allowance would not allow an ADU as long, because you've already basically have, you know, effectively two units on your property. You're not allowed to add a third one because of the use allowance. Thanks, Josh. Melissa, if you would like to send that question to Naomi, she'll be monitoring that task force. And that's a great, um, we're creating like a, um, a whole entire, I call it like a, I call it the bike rack or however you want to call it, of things to go over on the, I don't serve, I'm not going to serve on that task force, but that's a great point. And I think that that's really important for Northwest Denver. We have a lot of these parcels that are duplexes and single unit areas. So if you want to email us, we can make sure to put that in um, and highlight that during that project. Um, I saw somebody, Matthew, that you talked about traffic. I'm happy to have a conversation with you about traffic and all of the areas and all of the things, the, the conflicts that we're seeing on 32nd and Mole. Um, I'm working closely with Denver Police and with the Department of Transportation. We're supposed to come back and present to the West Highland Neighborhood Association shortly. But if you'd like, I'm happy to meet with you on a one-off. If you email district1 at denvergov.org, I can have a conversation with you about the need for crosswalks and reduced speeds along 32nd and Wall. I understand your concern. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so are there, I'm doing my best to monitor the chat. I think I can I, grab a couple more or can okay. consolidate okay. some themes um, of questions that we're seeing. So there's, there's some more kind of design uh, questions. Uh, so for example, um, can you convert your garage into an ADU or can you build your ADU on top of a garage? Um, and Josh was kind enough to, to answer this a little bit. Uh, the, the line is proceed with extreme caution on that. Um, in most cases, it doesn't work. Um, there, as I, as I mentioned in the presentation, there are very strict standards on on ADUs, what, where they can be sited, how they're built. And one of those reasons is because it is considered a, a dwelling unit. You know, it's a structure that's meant for a human being to live in. And so it has to meet pretty strict standards, not just in the zoning code, but the building code as well. Um, it's one of the reasons why they're more expensive to build um, because, you know, got to do the whole life safety thing. <laughs> um, so a lot of people, who would like to convert a garage or pop the top on a garage will uh, run into some, some major problems. It is almost always easier to start from scratch. Um, but again, I, I put the, the link to that ADUs in Denver project that Josh is running uh, in the chat. That's the type of question that may be investigated in that project. Um, and especially in terms of things of, of siting also how, this term called bulk really just like how how is the building sort of arranged does it fit in well with the neighborhood um maybe our rules that we have right now aren't they're creating kind of awkward looking buildings like for instance we have this story and a half rule um, about how big the adu can be um so please again check out that link we'll get involved um yeah definitely i'll add that you know we would love to see people be able to convert their garages. I mean, it's, you know, the sustainable thing to do, reuse a structure, but unfortunately in our climate, uh, our building code dictates that we need a, a foundation with a footing mm -hmm. that goes below, below the frost line, which is basically three feet underground and existing garage slabs do not meet that requirement. And so mm -hmm. it could be really expensive if you wanted to retrofit, go back and sort of underpin your foundation to do that. But unfortunately, the climate we're in dictates, you know, the life and safety requirements that we have. We hear a lot of like great success stories from like LA, you know, a much different climate where their foundation requirements aren't so extreme. They don't have, you know, freezing temperatures and things to worry about. And so people can convert their garage quite easily and cheaply there. But unfortunately here, you know, our building code is a little bit more stringent because of our climate. Yeah. And you also answered Annette's question that she was considering building, starting new, building a garage and an ADU on top. Um, that's a really common uh, choice. In fact, I would say, I've actually have not yet seen a plan for an ADU that didn't involve it being on top of a garage. Um, I know that they, they are out there, but 
it's interesting because it also kind of goes to that parking question. You're not required to provide parking with an ADU. You're actually not required to provide parking with any single unit house. Um, but people build garages and provide parking because how are you going to sell a house without one? Um, so we also do see that with, with garages, people want to be able, with their ADUs, I mean, people want to be able to A, have their own garage space for their main house. And also sometimes you see a three, a three car garage or, or a two car garage, or at least some sort of space for a potential ADU tenant or visitor to park back there. Cause it's something that everyone else is also thinking about. And Naomi, um, this is Annette. Hi Annette. Hi, I just wanted to ask also when, because I was thinking about that, I wanted a larger garage just for my vehicle too, mm -hmm. but it would work better to have one of the, you know, uh, garages for that apartment or, you know, whether I use it for my mother or use it for someone else. That way they don't have, you know, they're not parking on the street. There is an, uh, I'm in a historical area, I guess, the historical area. So would that be a bigger issue, a larger issue, or is it just that we have to get qualified through the city first? That's normal for either way, right? Because it, I noticed my area is in purple. Mm. You're in historic district. It yes. depends on if you, and I can also, I'm happy, I'll put my email in the chat. Anyone can email me with questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll find the person who does. Okay. Um, but yeah, if, if you're in a contributing building versus if you're in a non-contributing building, there's very different rules. I'm not sure what the difference, what's a contributing building? Uh, so a contributing building in a historic district is one that is considered like a, a foundational element of the historic district. It was built during the, the period of significance is what they call it. So the kind of time that the historic district is meant to represent. It has all the qualities that they're trying to preserve. So not every house that's inside of a historic district is a contributing building because there could be one that's like, you know, built in 1960s and doesn't, you know, they don't want to have the same rules for that. Um, so if you're in a contributing building, there's design review, lots of standards that you go through. Um, and it's not the same if you're not in a contributing building. Well, there's been a lot of, con I mean, rebuilds around me mm -hmm. or, you know, they demolish and um, rebuild a home. And they're, none of them are, you know, aesthetically correct to that time period. Mm. So, which is kind of strange, but maybe they were within a time period. I don't know, when did that start? When you rezoned us from, because I believe mine was R2 originally. There's a lot of R2 in the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought they rezoned us to R1 instead at the time. So that's kind of confusing. Oh, Annette, if you want to take an email, take Naomi. Online. Yeah, well, we're happy to get into the nuance because it is very nuanced. Um, okay. When we updated the zoning code from 2010, from the old like R1, R2, up into like the SU and, and all of these numbers and letters after, it's it gets so confusing. And then on top of that, at a historic district. So we are happy to spend the as much time needed personally helping you through that. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And then I see that I've been asked to answer by Pat DeFay, number six and seven. There's not really a question. I think it's more of a statement. So um, if this is if this proposal moves forward that they should only opt in. Unfortunately, the city doesn't do opt in type of rezonings like that. It's not a tool in the toolbox. I have thought about it. Oftentimes, that there is a tool, it would be nice to have the tool in the toolbox, but unfortunately, that tool does not exist currently. Um, and the West Highland rezoning, the required number of property owners for a majority should be 51%. I don't know where you got that number from, um, but I would like to have more than 50% in favor. That's what we've been, that's why we have the survey open, that's why we do outreach in the North Star. That's why we do as multiple meetings as possible. So, um, but to but to get a thousand surveys, we're gonna keep it open as much as possible and for as long as possible. 
So Pat, if you wanna go knock on your neighbor's, neighbor's door, if you're having coffee or you're walking through the neighborhood, please tell people to take this survey. This is why we're doing this and this is why we post it on Facebook Live. This is why we attempt to get as many type of outreaches and, and, and touch points as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just add on the uh, number six one, the opt-in? Why was it on West 46th Avenue? Opt it wasn't opt-in, opt opt-in, opt 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 opt-in, opt-out was- It wasn't, part. it wasn't an opt-in or opt-out. So that was not a sponsor city council led opt-in, opt-out. That was private property owners moving forward what they wanted to do. Well, so, you said the city doesn't allow it. They allowed it there. They, it wasn't a, it wasn't a map amendment like I'm proposing. I'm proposing this area, and they proposed that area. So it was a private property owner who worked with their neighbors. There were probably I think eleven, and I think out of the eleven homes, maybe nine decided to move forward. Private citizens moved that forward. I was not moving that forward. Yeah, it's technically, you know, it's considered, I guess, an individual rezoning. And so those nine members got together and individually rezoned it as a group. But yeah, legally right now, Blueprint Denver says that anyone in the entire city of Denver is legally allowed or has planned guidance to attempt to rezone their property for an ADU. And so uh, what we're trying to do here, the councilwoman is trying to you know, like think about a process that's more efficient than that. So it doesn't have to be 3,000 separate individual property owners coming together at separate times. But Exactly. And I think I might be hearing an underlying concern that I've talked to some other people about too and heard before, which is, what does the zoning do to me? Um, what does it do to my property, especially if I don't want to build an ADU? Or what if my neighbor builds an ADU? Or like, I don't want this zoning. Why do I, why do I have to have it? Um, and I mean, first of all, you don't, we don't have to have it. Um, that's what we're here to talk about. But what we can say is that this rezoning, unless you want to build an ADU, will not affect your property in a tangible way. Um, it is not going to spike your property taxes. It is a very small change in what we call entitlement. So entitlement means what you're allowed to do with your property. Now, if for some reason there was a rezoning to say like, hey, let's take everything here to a duplex zoning or to a apartment zoning, that's a huge change that would probably result in some big changes um, just based on the rezoning, maybe. But the way we've talked to the, um, the city assessor, so who runs the, the property assessments and property tax things, we've asked them now over a period of two years, first of all, is this rezoning gonna do anything bad for our constituents? Because that's the last thing that anybody wants to do. Um, they did not think that it would. And now two years later, we've asked them again, they have not seen any increases in property taxes that can be directly attributed to just a zoning change. So basically, if you if you don't want to build an ADU, this will not change anything about your, your property really until maybe at one point you want to build an ADU. Um, now, if you do build an ADU, that is the same as any major improvement on your property. So you, you pop the top, if you build a huge addition to it, um, your property value is going to go up. Um, so be prepared for that, but that is for your individual property. Um, and another thing about the way that uh, property assessments go is all about um, comparables. So I know I've heard some people concerned, well, hey, my neighbor is going to build an ADU. Well, will the, that fact that they've built an ADU make my property taxes or my value go up? And the answer is, is not really because all of a sudden your neighbor's property is very different from yours. So a real estate agent comes along and looks at the, the property with an ADU, that's a very different type of property than a property without an ADU. Um, it's not comparable. Uh, so I really, I hope that that answer is something that we've taken very, very seriously. And we know that that's kind of a concern that some people have heard, but everything, all the research we've done, all the professionals and people in the city involved in this and private real estate people we've talked to um, have kind of confirmed that it is, it is not something to be scared about. So I want to be respectful of people's times. I see one last question. Um, Josh, maybe you can, maybe I can take this, you can have this one. Are you allowed to put a deck on the third bay of, the, of a garage? I don't even know 
how to where to start with that one. I guess you're, you're talking about a deck on top of a garage. Typically, they're not allowed in the rear 35% of the zone lot in protected districts like single units because of, you know, people respect their backyard privacy. And so, no, they would not be allowed on top of a garage in most, uh, in single unit zoning at least. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Uh, uh, my question was, if you build a three-car garage, you put the ADU on two bays, and put a deck on the third bay. You still can't do that. Yeah, it'd be considered no no decks are allowed in the rear 35% of the zone lot because of that. Why, why was it allowed on the ADU at 32nd Raleigh Street? There's an, a deck on the third bay and a door from the ADU to the deck. Have you turned it in to 311 or sent it? sent a picture to my office so that we could have it looked at. Numerous people have turned, have turned that in over the last year. I'm not asking numerous people. I'm asking you. Have you sent that email to my office and so we could get a response to you? It was turned into 311 numerous times from numerous people. Okay, if you want to send, if anyone ever contacts 311 and you don't get a response, feel free to share the, um, everybody gets a ticket number and a lot of times people email my office and follow up and we can follow up with that ticket number but if you want to put the address in the chat we can look at it or you can email I know you know my email and you can email district one at Denver Gov. Yeah Pat you, you are allowed to have an entry if it's the entrance to the ADU you're allowed to have an exterior stair to access the unit but there's a you know minimum amount of square footage allowance it shouldn't be a a lounging deck that's you know 12 feet by 12 feet or anything like that and so i'm not sure specifically you know the deck you're referring to but i assume what it sounds like is the stairwell entrance well i think we have answered everything in the chat um and josh thank you so much for joining us on this cold chilly winter night naomi once again you you go above and beyond on your outreach and your presentation skills and your being able to put planner speak into regular speak. So thank you so much for that. And um, thank you for everyone who's joined us. Um, I usually end with a call to action. So my call to action would be that you please ask five of your neighbors to take this survey. And so that we can really get a good um, understanding of what this community would like. And one thing with, you know, representative democracy is we're not all going to agree, but we all sure do agree that Northwest Denver is a great place to live. As somebody who has been born and raised here um, and is raising my second generation, I graduated from North. My family's owned a small restaurant in Northwest Denver since 1972. Um, I love this place. It's the only place I've ever lived. And so 80211 and the North side is my home. And I'm so glad to be able to represent you all. And that I believe the home, our homes are some of our biggest investments. And so I understand that this conversation is really close to the heart because your home is where the heart is. And so we're open to hearing from you. I, hold, I host office hours almost every other Friday. If you would like to come and have an one-on-one uh, -on -one with me, if you're shy and you don't want to chat in the chat, or if you don't want to speak up, I understand that. Um, so feel free to reach out and we can set up a one-on-one -on -one with me when, during my office hours. And other than that, our last town hall, I think I have the date right, is January 29th. Um, and so we'll be here again. So we have another opportunity to hear from your neighbors and your community. And other than that, I wish everyone really safe um, and hope everybody is really healthy and hope you've had a good start to the new year. Yeah, thank you so much, every single person who attended. This was a great turnout, really appreciate it. And this will be uploaded to the webpage very soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.